Hello everyone and welcome to the August uh, webinar for the Ascolite Learning Design SIG uh, brought to you by myself Keith Heggett uh, and also Kashmira Dave and Leanne No, uh, who we are the co-conveners of the Learning Design SIG. We've got a very special guest with us today um, and we're really looking forward to hearing from him uh, but before we do just a few little bits and pieces uh, from me to kick off the session. The first thing I'd like to do is uh, acknowledge the traditional owners and Indigenous cultures present in Australia. So on behalf of the Learning Design Special Interest Group um, of Ascolite, I acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which we're meeting. I pay my respects to Elders past, present and emerging and extend that respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people present today. Um, I'm coming to you from Darug land uh, in what is Western Sydney now. Um, but if you want to tell us where you're coming from, please put that in the chat. Um, and, and yeah, it'd be good to get a, a bit of a picture of where everyone is coming from today. I also just want to remind you about some of the events that we've got coming up for the Ascolite uh, Learning Design SIG. Um, this year we started the Hackathons LD Hack, as it's called, um, which is a new activity and it's been really, really good so far. Our third Hackathon is coming up on next Thursday, that's the 24th. Um, it will be online and it's all about designing for inclusivity. Um, I was just putting to the final touches to that. It should be really good. Uh, and after that, we've got two uh, boot camp sessions, one in Sydney and one in Melbourne. Um, and they'll be all day sessions and we'll send out more details. If you're interested in any of these, you can find all of this information um, in the uh, Learning Design Group on LinkedIn, the Australian Association of Learning Designers. Um, and you can register your interest and make sure that you can uh, get more information as they come from. That's the best place to hear about what we're up to. Uh, so if you're not already a member of that group, I strongly encourage you to join it. All right, administration stuff out of the way. And let's start uh, diving into our special guest presenter today. Um, Ian Farmer is a distinguished academic and industry professional and has been at the forefront of technological innovation throughout his career. Uh, with an undergraduate degree from a Monash University and a long tenure with the Mars Corporation, Ian's expertise spans IT, business change and emerging technolo technologies across Australia and the Asia Pacific. After 10 years in advertising and business consultancy, Ian's pursuit of knowledge led him back to academia, where he recently submitted his Master's uh, of Research in Feedback Literacy. He's now teaching in the Faculty of Engineering and IT and also in the Faculty of Business at UTS and UNSW. Um, and his focus is on leveraging technology for better student experiences. It's this that makes him an authoritative voice in the field of AI and higher education. Um, and uh, his presentation for us today is called AI Tools and Technologies Reporting for Duty. I wanna start off by saying that this is going to be very much a hands-on um, kind of activity, you know, so, uh, Ian is going to challenge us to um, try things out, uh, tell us what we think. Uh, and uh, when when Ian was telling me about what he was going to plan for this session, um, he, he kept coming back and saying, I want people to say, is this valuable for learning designers? Does this have relevance for learning designers? Um, so that's what something that he's going to be calling on us to think about as he shows us all of these tools and technologies. So uh, without further ado, I am going to stop sharing my screen and hand over to Ian and say, Ian, welcome. We are looking forward to, to hearing all about AI tools. Yeah, thanks, Keith. It's, uh, it's great to be here. Um, I'm, I'm kind of late in the teaching kind of career stage, but I think I've been teaching um, at least graduates and staff members all my life. It's something that I enjoy. It's what led me back. I actually started my IT degree I remember in second year, the, uh, the cohort manager, it was an IT degree, came in and said, you guys are going to learn, you're the first cohort that's going to learn this new technology. And I thought, that's pretty cool, I wonder what it is. And uh, he said, it's going to change the world. And uh, something was called real-time programming, actually. But um, And the year, 1984, not the book, but the year, 1984. So that was kind of quite interesting. Um, I think AI is very much like 1984 was for transactional computing back then. And that's why I came back to academia two years ago to do my research masters. Let's see if I can share this, if that works. Okay, here we go. Um, 
And uh, but what I want to sh show you today is a bunch of tools. Let's just go through. We might we might come if we get time. We'll come back and do this exercise. The idea is to give you a bit of a useful box. When I was growing up as a as a as a, as a kid, I guess my mum had this thing called the useful box. I think she got it from play school, and it used to have all sorts of things in it. So whenever I got bored and asked for something, she'd say, "Go and check the useful box, Ian," and then usually be something in there which would stoke my curiosity. Um, so what we're going to cover today is a bit of, bit about these things, prompting, how we use AI in research, some summarization, writing, lesson plans, etc. Some of these you may have uh, be aware of, some of them you may not be aware of. Um, I think one of the challenges we have in academia is a large amount of our focus, both in terms of research and where we talk about AI, is really around writing. And there is so much more to AI that hopefully you will learn today. So my objective for today is that you can pick up one or two tools out of this session that will make your life easier. And if, if we can do that, that's a win for me. So this is a quick start from the literature. Um, this is AI in education globally, right? So five big themes are emerging. Educators and students, they have limited experience, you know. Largely, they're not tech heads, but they do have plenty of optimism. Like I'm sure there's some negativism as well, but in general, my experience has been educators and students bring optimism, and with that comes curiosity. Second theme is that there's an urgent need for guidance on ethics. Some universities, uh, in fact, when I work out, published their ethics policy before November last year. When we came back in March this year, everything had changed, right? So there's certainly a need for continued guidance on ethics and, and some degree of agility is required. So I'll put that link in the chat, some latest thinking from July that might be useful for your organisations. Um, AI training is really urgent and critical. We have a problem right now, I think, where um, AI literacy in students is higher than AI literacy in teachers. Um, that's a problem, I think. So we need to address that gap. We also need to make it fair for students so that they all have a, at least a minimum level of AI training. Um, one, so they don't get in trouble with assessment um, review committees, but also so they can actually be treated fairly like everyone else in their learning. And, and the last theme, which I'm sure you would have heard about, we'll cover one of these issues today, is rethinking how we do assessments. And as I've realised in um, this year, the universities don't tend to change things very quickly. So that's where we're going. There's some, I'll put these references, or maybe Keith can in the chat. Maybe I'll just copy the whole three. That's why I put it in there. Um, now, from those references, here's four concerns that they generally agree on. The concerns for academia is cheating. Probably heard lots about that. Second concern is privacy. Are we allowed to upload stuff into ChatGPT? Um, the third one's biases and ethical concerns. And then the fourth one is unfair advantages. So that's kind of the concerns. You probably should be pretty aware of those. But there are also opportunities, administrative efficiencies. The thing that's not talked about enough, um, maybe because there's a bit of fear of will my job be gone. There's so many. Uh, people in academia who don't teach, actually, who do a lot of other stuff that is inefficient, as you probably are all aware of, that can be sped up and reduced uh, using AI to help us spend more time teaching or giving feedback. AI gives us the opportunity to do scalable personalised learning. You mentioned, Keith, the hackathon on inclusivity. Um, AI has a place to play there to allow people different ways to learn. There needs to be more efficiency and more effectiveness in the way we assess. Uh, I'll cover that briefly. There's, n there's not enough research being done in that place at the moment. And finally, what's the workplace relevance? You know, um, do I still have a job as a teacher? Will my job change? You know, teachers ask me that and I say, you know what, every job's going to change. Most of the jobs we have today are going to be so different in the next five years. Just get used to it, yeah? Um, 
Uh, one thing I would say about teachers, there are so many things that won't change, right? All right, let me go through this. This is my kind of guide for getting teachers and students up to a basic level of AI literacy. Many of the teachers that say, I, I tried this with ChatGPT and it just didn't work. It's because they aren't prompting right. And there's a whole lot of uh, uh, areas that I can go into on prompting. In fact, I'll give you my best resource that I use for prompting. It's called Learn Prompting. Uh, that starts from very basic, it goes through to very advanced. So if you do get the hang of prompting, that's a good resource for you. But my one simple, it's do you prompt AI to be beauty or beast, right? And of course, I'm using the rose um, theory there. So you want to start by telling AI what role do you want it to play? Is it a school teacher? Is it a maths teacher for year 10? Is it a travel consultant? What objective or outcome do you want to give AI? Um, what style, tone or language? And th this can be a professional style or casual style. That helps dictate what it will do. And then finally, an exemplar. If you can give an example of what you want, or at least start an example of what you want, but also include what you don't want. Doing things will give you a easy way to, I think, I think get better at prompting for beauty rather than beast. So let me just, I'm going to see if I can jump to my screen. Let's see. Uh, I'll go for this screen. Let's see if I might jump this over there. Yeah, that's working. So here's normal chat bit GBT for this. Uh, I'm going to use just GBT 3.5. Um, to save you waiting for me to type in, I think I've got some of these queued up. Uh, I, I haven't. Uh, let's just see. Uh, why can't I try? Oh, I'm in the. I'm looking at the uh, blackboard screen rather than my real screen. All right. So you might do something like this. You are a travel consultant. That's the role. The objective would be your objective is to find me modes of travel between Sydney and Brisbane. If you do use Sydney, by the way, often ChatGPT will think you're in Canada. So because I put Brisbane there, contextually it will know I'm talking about Australia. Um, so that's my objective. Please use Australian English. GPT will default to American if you don't do this and, and provide the output as a table with mode of transport um, example carriers costs what else maybe a comment All right how long it takes because of how long it takes, all right, and a column for length of travel. So there you go. So it's giving me something that I've asked for very specifically um, using the rose model, right? Um, let's look at another example. Uh, have I got it stored somewhere? Uh, 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 you are a learning designer and you are deciding on topics for the next uh, so I, conference. Please recommend uh, for three areas within uh, learning design that relate to AI. Um, please provide references. Now, ChatGPT, the free version, um, only goes up to 2021, as you probably know. Um, these references 
are okay because they are from before 2021. So um, you can verify those with the link. If I click on that link, it will bring up uh, the reference. I can check who the authors were. Is that right? Uh, no, it looks like it's, it looks like it's wrong, right? Yeah, wrong link. So um, ChatGPT is is guilty of always doing wrong links. So for things like this question, you are much better off using Bing. So if I go to Bing, Bing by the way is just Bing.com/new. If I go back over here, what you use for Bing. Um, Bing's actually quite good at this sort of question. In fact, I hope I've still got it. Uh, I haven't got it in my history. Uh, oh, I see. Yeah, perplexity is a good one as well. Um, you can also, if you if you do have access, by the way, to GPT-4, let me just show you that quickly. GPT-4 has a couple of things, code interpreter and plugins that you can use. One of the plugins that I often use for GPT-4 is the Scholar AI plugin. And when I, if I ask that same question that I just did before, um, that would come up with uh, newer references because of that plugin. All right, let's, uh, I'll come back to Bing because there are some things that Bing does really well. There are some things that Bing's not, not what's the word? Bing is uh, governed a little bit more than uh, ChatGPT in different ways. Um, the first thing you'll see with Bing is you see this button here, creative, balanced or precise. That's actually setting the temperature level within AI. And, uh, you know, creative means um, tell me anything, make up some ideas if you want. Balance says try and be mostly true, but still make some stuff up. And precise says I really want you to be kind of 90% true if you can. Something like that, right? Um, you can uh, adjust these things in the back end of different language models to be more precise than this. But it depends what you're asking. If large language models were built with all this button always set to precise, it just wouldn't be as effective. Part of the strength of AI is that it actually allows itself to connect things and, and, and kind of make stuff up. So that's part of its strength. All right. So that link is interesting. That's not a good link. Uh, let me go see if I can get back to... All right. Uh, let's go to Bing and we'll do a balanced one. I'll try. But uh, as an academic writer, give me 10 topic areas for the special interest group learning design that have the best chance of being accepted. Um, at your, I'll put your response in a table with topic number of papers, comments. Let's see how it goes with that. It's pretty close to the Rose model, but Bing will do a much better job at this than what ChatGPT would do. Now, I don't know who wants to verify these, but here we have the papers in the last five years. Let me just zero in on learning design frameworks. It says there are 10. Um, provide the papers for and include a column with the references. Yeah, I think. So it's not quite giving me the right answer. It's giving me kind of generic stuff, but it it, it seems to be going to the wrong spot here, right? Um, please try and give me references for the Learning Design Frameworks papers using the So sometimes you have to tell ChatGPT uh, where it's going wrong. You know, it hasn't found Aslo.org for whatever reason. Maybe the SEO is not quite right for Bing. Um, 
there you go. What does it say? What's its excuse now? It's not able to provide full text. Okay. Can you provide the AI links? Ah, okay. There you go. Interesting. Sometimes this works, sometimes it doesn't. Any questions on that? So we've just been covering, if I can go back to uh, my present that I'll just bring up here. Can't quite read the chat, hang on. Any questions in the chat? No. Oh, I could have put that link in. Thanks, Penny. Um, we won't need that for now. Gonna... So the next thing I wanted to cover was how do you use AI in research? Who's head of the illicit tool? Oh, who hasn't heard of the illicit tool? Oh, new for me. Okay, well, this is a, a this is like think of this like a search engine for research questions. It's really helpful if you do research on a paper. Um, so you type in a research question. I'm just typing in how can we use AI in automated assessments. Now, the first thing before I can press search, I can actually brainstorm the research questions. It will give me four or five other possible research questions that I could use instead. So has anyone got a favourite out of these? This one looks at the ethics, the challenges, the benefits. What about the last one? So you've done your research question. What it's going to do is give you the paper titles, just like Google Scholar would. But as well as that, you get an abstract summary. You can toggle on over here the intervention, if there was one that might be useful, or the outcomes measured, there's trouble. Okay, so now I've got three columns all at once, papers, abstract, outcomes measured. Um, let's say I think this paper and this paper and these ones are really helpful for what, I'm talk what I wanted to research. So I'll say then to elicit, show me more like the ones I've just starred. And it will refresh the list just by those four ones that you've started. And I'm getting a, a bigger list now. Um, you notice also over here, it's had a crack at summarising the top four papers in this research question. That's kind of useful. Um, I don't know, Keith, you may, you may be able to respond to academic misconduct with, with cutting and pasting this, but this is what the tool does. It, it's going to help you research faster so you can spend more time adding value to the literature, to the literature, not spending more time, you know, wasting time, I suppose. You can export these results as a bib file. So if you use EndNote, you can upload bibs into EndNote. You can also export them as a CSV. Um, any questions on, on a list of... Yeah, well, it, it, I guess it depends on, on how, how, how you actually authorise the tool, but um, we're certainly using Elicit in a design thinking class that I'm teaching. In fact, I just ran from that class to come to here. Uh, then and we're doing our research next week and Elicit's one of the tools that I'm recommending students use. Um, what I would normally do if I was doing research or teaching someone research, I'd grab the bib file and I would upload it into another tool called Research Rabbit. Has everyone heard of Research Rabbit? Um, in the interest of time, I'm just going to go through this one really quickly, but I will quickly pop the link in the chat. Uh, Penny, you want to talk to this one? <laughs> All right, so you, end, you would start with a list of um, papers, right? So in this case, I'm looking at AI literacy in higher education. I can't remember how many papers I've got here. Let's say it's 30 or 40. In fact, I can see the sign here, it's 60 papers. But I want to, it's not enough, I need more. 
So show me the later work from the people who wrote those 60 papers. That's interesting. Great. That pops a list, right? I think, ah, oh, this one's important. Not only that, I can start to drill in on who's connected to who and why. I can look at it by network or by timeline. There's a lot of interesting things you can do here to choose essentially your list. If I click on that one, I can read through the abstract. Yeah, I think I like that one. I can add it to my list, right? So that's now added. If I go back a little bit to this, it now says 61 papers. The great thing about Research Rabbit, it's great for research teams. You can collaborate on the same list in a way that you probably can't do with desktop tools. So once you've got your list, you can, I mean, there's some other things that, that Research Rabbit does, but you can export the whole papers to big text RIS format CSV. You can make the list public and create a shareable link. So if I make a, a shareable link of that list I just made, the 61 references now for AI literacy, uh, hopefully I can give you the free gift of that link. Okay. If you sign up for Research Rabbit, you can get access to that list of papers. Um, these are the connections from the current list. So you can see, you know, who are the people talking most about our literacy. Yeah, that's right, Keith. When you use them together, it's, uh, it's, it, it becomes useful, right? Because different people have different areas of expertise and they can, you know, this, all of research nowadays is combining things together. My background in IT meant that I used to do a lot of work. In, in fact, one of the things that I'm quite good at now is connecting the dots between different divisions of, of the organisation. That's what I did for 30 years and um, I'm still surprised, but maybe not so much now on how narrow academics are. I mean, it's part of the PhD process, right? You get forced into this narrow lane. Um, don't stay there necessarily, right? Um, it's okay to connect the dots. That's where a lot of value is, I think, in research. All right, let's go from uh, research now into, I'm gonna do one quick example on summarization. So uh, let's see if I can stop sharing that. Where do I go to stop sharing? I'm over here. Oh, I'm in the wrong spot. Right. Uh, I have to go share my file again. Who was here for the last uh, learning design SIG? Two months ago? Does anyone remember this talk? Vaguely, anyone else? Um, the, the, talker, the talker was Peter Raymond Kashmir. Okay, can you can either of you answer these two, top two questions? How can knowledge technologies be used in educational design? Or what is the value of knowledge graphs in learning design? And why are those questions? Yeah, go for it. No, I was just uh, I was just wondering because knowledge graph was very new to like most of the people because it's everybody was talking about AI, 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 you know, uh, and so uh, what Peter said was uh, most of the people found very technically challenging. Okay, yeah, I can I can help with that actually. You should bring yeah. me back to talk about knowledge management next one. Um, I I had a job as a knowledge manager for Mars actually. I was the Asia Pacific guy. Um, mm. And um, we looked at knowledge in, in a number of ways. And so there's, there's data, and if you inform data, it becomes information. If you give information insights, it becomes knowledge. And you apply experience to knowledge, you get wisdom, right? There's four areas, yeah. data, information, knowledge, and, and wisdom. Yeah. Back in 1984, yeah. Uh, yeah, sure. In 1984, it started the information automation process, and that continued through the internet. What we're seeing with AI now is a knowledge efficiency, um, uh, I think, disruption. 
Sorry, what was your question? No, uh, it wasn't my question. I'm just saying, uh, oh. I, I remember him saying that um, Wikipedia is an authentic source of, of knowledge and uh, how it can be used in like kind of any authentic research as well. Yeah, what's well, a, a, um, a debatable one? <laughs> um, certainly, <laughs> So, well, I mean, it's debatable in the sense that anyone can create a Wikipedia page. Yeah, that's the whole point of it. Um, certainly from a marketing point of view, when I was in marketing, um, looking after websites for other people, if you can get an inbound link from Wikipedia, that really helps your Google juice because it's a very trusted source by Google. Uh, the same with uh, yeah. uh, academia. Yeah. Ian, may, may I ask you, like, where your mic sits? Because I think... Uh, um, uh, closer to mic would be good in terms of sound. Okay. Yep. Good point. Or, or you have a head, if you have headphones, that would be even better. Uh, I do actually. Uh, all right. I'll put those on while we. All right. The answer to those two questions. Let's see if this. Uh, oh, it doesn't work. Uh, the um, the slide progression doesn't work in here. Never mind. I don't know what they are because I had them there. Let's go back to this window instead. Okay, so here's the YouTube link for that video. I've got a tool called Summarize. There are many tools that do this that summarize YouTube videos. You don't want to watch one hour of Peter um, or you, maybe you do, you can click this summarize button. It's a Chrome plugin. Um, you get a seven day free trial, but it's, then it's $9 a month, I think. It provides two things. It provides insights, which are here, a summary, which is, you can see by time. Um, it can also, I actually want it in Chinese. Thanks very much. So give it to me in Chinese or whatever other language that you'd like the summary on. Is there anyone from Denmark here? Probably not. Let's go back to English. So there, insights and summary in about 20 seconds. I can copy that link and then this is what the link looks like. It creates its own unique link. The video is still here. Um, this was the key idea. Um, it then gives you the insights that Peter gave. These little icons, an idea, you know, some research. The detailed summary and finally at the end it has some possible questions as a result of that particular video. How cool is that? So the app is called A to Five. I mean if you've got YouTube teaching that you want to re-engage, uh, run up through this or any YouTube clip actually. Uh, in fact uh, I see if I can bring this one up. Let's see, uh, I'll do it later. Um, I I was watching an AI conference two three weeks ago. Now it was on American time from one a.m. to seven a.m. and I really wanted to watch the the student session on the students' perception of AI. And I thought, oh, I'll, you know, I'll just watch the Zoom replay in the morning. I'm just too tired. So I got up at eight o'clock Saturday, really keen to watch this. And I looked at the Zoom recording, it was like an hour. I thought, I don't want to spend an hour listening to students and moderating on a panel. And so I, I didn't uh, have 85 at that stage. So I, wrote, I said, look, I can use normal ChatGPT. So I, I got ChatGPT to, I uh, first downloaded the transcript, which Zoom gives you, that's the, that's the text. I put that transcript into ChatGPT and said, can you summarize this? And then I said, can you also then make me a table of the insights and from this, the themes that the students are saying, but also in that table, give me example quotes from the students to verify that theme. It took me about 10 minutes. I had uh, 10 themes. I thought, great, that's good use of my Saturday to spend 50 minutes doing something else than watching a video. So that's how you might use 85 or summarization. I think you can use it in learning as well. Okay. Um, this will get better, by the way. 
and we'll start to do more than just text. Now, let me just quickly go back to my Prezo. I can remember what's next. So in uh, YouTube summarizer, you said is 85.app? Um, it's that link I put in, 85.app, yeah. Yep. Um, oh, by the way, I mean, don't, don't, don't rush up out and buy a year subscription necessarily. Um, uh, who would be the, in the best place to provide an AI summary tool for YouTube, do you think? Um, any guesses? It's probably not 85, is it, right? Uh, so I'm just trying to find my slide. It's hidden away in some other screen. Uh, all right, it's okay. Let me see if I'm still sharing. Where am I? I'm sharing this. Okay. All right. The next, next thing I want to quickly show you is writing. Now, a lot of you would have heard about writing um, and how it's used for plagiarism, the negative side. Um, we have a journalism uh, uh, school here as part of the FAS faculty, and they are actually enabling students to use AI in their uh, teaching this semester. What I did, um, this, this example, I, I said, give me the top news from Europe this week. That was the first comment, right? I used the plugin. This was ChatGPT4, by the way. It used the browser pilot plugin. That enables ChatGPT to get current news and brings it over the 2021 threshold. So here's what it came back with. And I don't know if you remember from two weeks ago, the big news in Europe was the migrant crisis. As, you know, um, and in fact, I, I heard the, you love this, the UK Prime Minister um, invented this new slogan and it was called Stop the Boats. I wonder where he got that from. Anyway, this is what it came back. It gave me these four different topics. So I said, okay, write me a news correspondent journalism opinion piece on the migrant crisis in Europe, and please include sources. And this is the result. I'll try and roll through slowly. It's not bad for a 750, 800-word assignment. Um, but I said, I'm not happy with that. Now assess that opinion piece against the following rubric. So this is the rubric I gave it. It wasn't that specific. I just said, give me the evidence, depth, sustainability, adherence, et cetera, right? So then ChatGPT is now assessing its own opinion piece against my rubric. And here's what the score was. 18 for that, 15 for this one, and so forth, with an overall assessment of 60. I thought, oh, not bad, it's a pass, but I'm not happy with that. Please rewrite it, make it 750 words, and based on that feedback. So then it rewrote the whole thing. I'll share the um, I'll share the link for this so you can look it up any time of the conversation. And it got to the end. It's a little bit better written, as you probably see. And I said, now reevaluate it. Good news. I'm now getting, according to ChatGPT, 87 out of 100. Ooh. Uh, two things to note here. It's pretty good at writing, yes. If you know how to prompt and take time with dialogues, even better. Um, it's also getting good at assessments against rubrics. So that's the good news, I think. Um, it probably won't, uh, the ethics people won't let us turn that on anytime soon. If you do turn on automated assessments, it's only fair to let students know that you are using automated assessments. It's one of the policy things that are in place now. But um, certainly AI can do a lot of heavy lifting for that. So that's writing. Uh, how are we going for time? I need to quickly through. All right. I won't go into this one, but I did the same thing with Elon Musk's uh, presentation here. I downloaded his transcript and evaluated it here against a rubric. 
so I'll skip that. Uh, all right, the next thing I want to talk through is eBud. If you haven't heard of eBud, it's really just a collection of topic prompts that you can use with AI, all right? So it looks like this, the interface. Let me just show you. You start with what subject are you trying to, so you're a learning designer, right? We're all learning designers here. I want ChatGDP to be a tutor. So this is the tutor prompt. Now notice that prompt is a lot more like a program than a prompt. And I'm going, gosh, I'm a learning designer, I'm not a programmer. Don't worry. The only thing you have to pay attention to is this stuff here. These are the parameters. Remember I said you were going to give style in the rows model? These are the parameters you would give your AI tutor. So I could say depth equals undergrad. Uh, topic equals learning design or language. Something like that. Is that a good topic? Uh, what else? So I'm just hitting the parameters that it did, you know, now it's, it's giving me back the other parameters just in case I didn't know. I could say, well, please put language to Australian. He's taking that to the nth degree. Um, but off he goes now. I can just say plan and oh, plan, plan, plan. It will generate a lesson plan for that topic based on the level of my students, etc. I could have given it the time as well. Yeah, and Tony is hard to, to get right here, but you can. You can uh, uh, train it, I suppose, with examples. If you gave it examples, not to use Aussie slang, but to use, you'd probably get off saying, I want British English. Um, and then start. And Socratic approach is a good one. A great use of AI, which I haven't got in the deck today, is getting AI to debate, it's a great way to learn. You pick a side, um, it could be like, is ethics good for IT students? Um, or is ethics good for companies, I should say? Um, I do yes or no, and let the AI be the other in that. And you swap sides, it really helps you refine your argument, and I think it's a very good way to learn. All right, there's an example. Um, uh, quiz generators, I try to make a quiz for learning design professionals and this is what it came up with. Does anyone want to have a go at number one? How can AI driven predictive analysis influence the design of learning experiences in higher education? Uh, if you look closely, the correct answer has a bracket around it. Huh. Um, I should have said at the end. But yeah, I mean, if I go back in this one, it was quite easy at the start. Yeah. So I asked AI to be more, uh, more complex, right? Classroom activity is another one. So, you know, I asked for it, what did I asked for here, um, an introduction to classroom management, because I'm teaching teachers, right? So it, it said, here's the teacher instructions, the handout, work play, et cetera. Um, uh, all of these are free so far, except for the A to five key, good question. All right, let's move on to the next one. So that's uh, a good way to do lesson plans, pretty much tutoring a lot of things. Um, um, this is my one of my favourite ones at the moment. In fact, I've got it running right now. I don't know if you can see it. You can't. Udall does this. Udall records you speaking to your webcam. You only need to do 20 seconds um, and it will record what you're saying. So here's my recordings over the last two weeks. 
my average pace that I speak at is, uh, where's my pacing, is about one, 120 to 170 words per minute. Um, Beautiful saying it's in the green zone. That's cool. Um, what weak words are I using? Apparently, it was telling me the other day, I start 10% of my sentences with the word so. Um, I was telling my partner and she said, yeah, that's a farmer thing. All your brothers do that too. So, okay, that's interesting. Um, but here's some feedback I'm getting that I probably haven't had from a real human tutor. Um, so it gives you filler words. It can, it can even, uh, if I click practice, I don't know if you can see this. Yeah, you can. I can click start. Um, this tool will this tool will link with uh, Teams and Zoom. It's, I wonder if it's going to get into a loop. It's, it's recording me as I'm going. I can have it prompt me inside a Teams meeting to say, remind about these three things. Um, the example I use on their homepage is if you're asking for a pay rise and it's an interview with your boss, have Beautiful running, it will encourage you during that meeting process. So how often does a, a real human tutor able to give feedback while I am talking? In fact, see this, it says time's up, finish strong, or stop here. Um, if I say that recording, it will just analyze what I've just done. Um, and it's got to take a bit of time, but I used it's it's once, there it was. I used Ah, uh, once, um, was I not inclusive? No, I wasn't, that's good. I used one weak word. What about my delivery? It's still figuring that out. Can a human do this over and over again while a student practices? It says I'm speaking too fast. There you go, word choice. But you get the idea. I'm. Um, because of my sins of working 10 years in advertising, I get to teach the FEIT 3MC finalists. And so I'm using this tool to coach them, hopefully to knock help over because help always wins those 3MCs. In fact, here is one of my students. Um, I uploaded her 3MC actually, her name is Eve. And this is the results of her 3MC. She's given me permission to share this, but um, Pretty cool, right? I think you can use that. Yep. All right. Um, we can even get AI to translate for us. We can't hear you, Ian. Uh, I'll, I'll put the link in and you can watch this one later. It's me uh, overdubbing myself halfway through into Chinese and I have to also lip sync myself. Uh, this video, which you may not be able to hear as well, the audio and the visuals of this guy are completely AI generated. So it will be not long before we can deep fake tutors and have them be in two places at once. That would be cool. Uh, it raises ethical questions. Uh, last one. So which? Uh, I went, yeah, sorry. So which tool, uh, tool did you use for this uh, uh, language? Uh, I, used, um, I used a tool called Clone Dub for the audio, but then I had to use a different tool called Sync Labs for the lip sync, and then I have to do some other tricks to put it together. But this will be a one button click just like summarize by the end of this year, I believe, and you'll be able to go, you know, mm. presenting Chinese. That's really cool for equ equity, I think, in education. Um, I'll just show you this one quickly. Um, I did this live with uh, a class about a month ago. I said, how would we solve the STG goal of poverty in India? And this AI app, I can share the link, it sets itself its own task. It's automatically generating its own tasks. Um, here's what it came up with. It took about 30 seconds to actually start and then it went through this. It got to the end and it had 11 strategies for reducing poverty in India. But the strategy it did to get there, it said, first, let's define what poverty is in the country. Then 
what's being done today, then look at initiatives around the globe that are successful. How can we apply those to India? It's a great way to help students um, break down complex problems. All right, I think that's all we've got time for. I will pause the sharing. If you do have questions, feel free to uh, ask me later. You ask Keith. I have been happy to, I mean, I could talk about this all day. I'm passionate about this stuff. I love it, but uh, I'm also passionate about teaching. Over to you, Kashmir. Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, we already have a hand raised from Penny. Oh, thank, thanks so much. Thanks so much, Ian. So great. Um, just while uh, you're there and the rest, of, the rest of our attendees is a brains trust, a friend was asking, is there any AI that can do verbal, I mean, audio um, chat? She, she's, a good, she's a good student of French. She wants to talk to an AI and have it have a conversation back with her, not not speech to text, text to speech, but speech to speech. Yeah, that, that, that's available now with Bing. So um, I, I can show you potentially uh, where it's been. Oh. Oh, can you see the screen? Yep. Yeah. So in Bing, you've got a little button here. That's the microphone. Boom. I've got my hands up here so you can see them. Can you please research what the capital of Spain is for me? Now, if I was doing this on my mobile... It Searching would... for capital of Spain. The capital of Spain is Madrid. Madrid is the most populous city of Spain with almost 3.4 million inhabitants and a metropolitan area population of approximately 6.7 million. Anyway, you get the idea. But, but, um... Great. Pilot AI is a good one to, to uh, I'll put this in the chat. You can look, you can use this one later. Pi is like a, a great chatbot for your teenager. He wants to chat about everything and everything. Oh, Penny, you know Pi, great. <laughs> and you can, maybe you can give me your view on Pi. Um, Pi works on, if you've got an iPhone, it runs on an app. If you use WhatsApp, it, it runs on WhatsApp. Um, it gives it some sort of continuity, not a full memory, but maybe about two days. Yeah. It always ends with a question. So Ian, I've got a question. This is Leanne at the moment. I know we've only got a couple of minutes and you know, that's a great presentation showcasing the various types of um, various types of tools that we could use as well. One of the things that we're kind of grappling with at the moment is how do we close that gap between student or even individuals like us as women. For us, we're pretty lucky. We've been around for the last few years and we've learned and part of our work experience along the way. But how do we look at closing the gap between developing learner students to be able to critically judge, analyze, evaluate the information that's presented to them? Because obviously, you know, we've got AI that can have access to many different knowledge sources, etc. One of the key things that we're kind of grappling with, how do we close that gap? You know, how, how, how do we close that cognitive, that developmental gap? And I think that seems to be like almost a holy grail of things at the moment, because it takes time for people to learn, to fail, you know, to learn, to be able to evaluate all these resources to see whether it's any good or not down the track and to question it, etc. Have you found anything along your journey that would help support that? Closing that gap. Um, that's my quote there. Um, yeah, look, I'll, I'll stop sharing Pi, but see how Pi sort of it didn't answer it. He wanted to keep the conversation going. Um, look, I think it's about getting. That's the thing that teachers need to keep doing what we always have done, right? It's it's teaching people how to think and how to know. How do you know what you know? It's the same with search. Often search will give you fake news, right? We saw that with the US election. So um, training people right now where there is uh, uh, fake stuff, I mean, I don't know if you heard of the crap test, how, how to verify sources with the crap test. 
um, mm. I've been using Bing to check sources with the crappiest. It sometimes gets it really right. It sometimes doesn't. So you just need to apply critical thinking. I think we've just brought that in in the new uh, curriculum. I think for high schools and primary schools as a, as a kind of a competency. So that's I think the next generation is going to have that a little bit more than we did. But yeah, no, Good thank question, you. Mate. It's it's a tough one at the moment, and I think it's one of those things if we could look into a bit further, because then um, that will actually like it's almost the holy grail in a sense to be able to support that and to really close that learning gap to be able to, you know, evaluate all these resources that we have and be able to use it to the best of our knowledge as well. So yeah, I mean the the debate one's probably the closest where you teach kids to debate issues that that aren't black yeah. and white, right? A lot of international Chinese students particularly struggle with dealing with ambiguity. They can't kind of, uh, um, I guess they're used to things being black or white. So it's a new skill to learn. So getting into debate issues that aren't, that have grey in them is a great way to practice that. And it's the same Absolutely. with uh, Absolutely. Well, on that note, um, we're just a minute over time. We'd like to, like on behalf of, you know, the Ascite Learning, um, design special interest group we do like to thank you for your time um, and sharing your knowledge and expertise and the various types of ai tools that we could use across learning uh, research and for learning designers elsewhere as well so thank you so much ian um just uh you know praise for you as well this um this session will be recorded and made available via our ask youtube and media channel as well thank you so much all right it's very welcome thanks ian We stop the recording. We can. If uh, if people have 